What's going on everyone? Welcome back into another installment to my top 100 players series. Today we're going to be looking at players that I have ranked between 81st and 90th. Now these rankings are for the 2021-2022 season. So as I said in the last video, these are predictive rankings. It is a bit based off last year, but it's mostly based on how I think players will perform going into next season. Leave a like on this video, even if you disagree with my opinions. I know that's a crazy concept to some, but just because you disagree with where I have your player ranked, that doesn't mean you have to dislike the video. So hit that like button. It helps me out and I greatly appreciate it. Also, if you disagree, let me know in the comment section below. And without further ado, let's jump into players 81 through 90. And at 90, I have Dallas Mavericks forward Tim Hardaway Jr. He was a guy who shot the ball really well last season, shooting 39% from three, averaged almost 17 points per game. He's kind of the Mavericks third scorer, but Chris Tapps Porzingis has a lot of games where he disappears and Tim Hardaway Jr. has to step up. He had some really good moments in the first round against the Los Angeles Clippers in last year's playoffs, and he's just a guy that you can trust. He can go out there and get you a bucket, but he can also play off the ball. He can catch and shoot. He can shoot off screens, and that makes him a very effective scorer because you can fit him in next to pretty much anybody and he's going to be able to be cohesive with them. So I have Tim Hardaway Jr. 90th in my top 100. At 89, this guy might be a big surprise to a lot of people, but I have Daniel Gafford, the big man from the Washington Wizards. Now, he only played 14 minutes per game last season, but in those 14 minutes per game, he was phenomenal. Now, I'm going to rattle off some per 36 minute stats here for Daniel Gafford, but first, I feel like I should explain why I use them. I'm not saying that if he was playing 36 minutes per game, these are the exact stats he would get. He would be game planned for more, would have to play more against starters, would have to deal with more fatigue. So, obviously, this isn't a direct extrapolation, but I use per 36. 36 more to get a feel for what Gafford is doing kind of on a per minute basis and just to really put his numbers in a perspective that people can really understand how good they are because if you look at seven points per game four rebounds per game a block and a half per game that doesn't look too great he's only playing 14 minutes per game per 36 last season Gafford averaged 17 points per game 10 and a half rebounds and 3.4 blocks per 36 that's phenomenal. He's a guy who I think takes a leap next year. I think he should be the starting center for the Washington Wizards. Robin Lopez is gone. Thomas Bryant is coming off an injury. I think Daniel Gafford ends up being the starting center next year for the Washington Wizards. He has guys that can feed him the ball, guys that can feed him lobs, guys that can get him easy buckets in Spencer Dinwiddie and Bradley Beal. But if he starts and plays around 30 minutes per game, he has a legitimate chance to lead the league in blocks per game. When you look at that combined with his efficiency and he's a solid reader, rebounder. Uh, I don't know how I could have left him out of my top 100 thinking that he's a guy that could push for three blocks per game next year. So this spot for Gafford is all with the expectation that he gets a big minutes bump and continues to produce on a per minute basis similar to what he did last year and therefore I have him 89th. At 88 I have Robert Covington of your Portland Trailblazers. Now we all know what Rocco can do. He's one of the premier three and D role players in the entire NBA. Last year set a career high for three-point percentage he shot less last year than he had pretty much during his entire NBA career he didn't get necessarily the best shots last year I think that could improve this year playing in an offense that seems like it'll be less predicated on 1v1 creation and more predicated on ball movement moving players and generating good shots through with the motion of the offense itself I also feel like he got a little underrated defensively I feel like he's such a great on-ball defender that people like to rag too much on his on-ball defense I think his on-ball defense is fine. I still think it's above average. Obviously, it's not as good as his off-ball defense, but it sort of became a thing where his on-ball defense with some people could just nitpick last year, and, and I don't think he gets enough credit for his on-ball defense. I have him 88th in my top 100. At 87, I have Toronto Raptors big man Chris Boucher, who took a leap in production last year, averaging almost 14 points per game, seven rebounds per game, and almost two blocks per game. Now, this was all with him only playing 24 minutes per game per 36. He was a 20 and 10 guy, averaging almost three blocks per game. He also shot 38% from three, 51% from the field, and this is a guy who would fit in on any team in the NBA as a guy who has the foot speed to play some four, and he could shoot well 
well enough to play some four, but he can also be a rim protecting stretch five. I would have him higher on this list if there wasn't a couple question marks that I had regarding him potentially starting. There was a interview with his head coach, Nick Nurse, in which Nurse kind of cringed at the idea of Chris Boucher starting. I don't know why he would because Chris Boucher was phenomenal last year and he is by far the best big man on this entire team. But it seems like Nick Nurse might be against playing him the 30 minutes per game he deserves and starting him, which has him a little bit lower on my list. If I was certain he was going to go into next season playing over 30 minutes per game, he would not be in this video. He would be in a future top 100 players video because defensively, offensively, he was phenomenal last season. And I don't think it's an aberration. I expect similar production out of him in the future. He just needs more minutes and it remains to be seen whether Nick Nurse will give them to him or not. At 86, I have Miles Bridges, the forward from the Charlotte Hornets. He averaged almost 13 points per game last year, but what was most notable was his bump in efficiency. He shot 50% from the field, 40% from three. This was a big improvement from the season he had before in which he only shot 42% from the field and 33% from three. So part of this can be explained by having a lamello ball as a creator playing next to him to help him get higher quality shots, but it's also some of him just resembling the player he was more in college at Michigan State where he was an absolute star. He was doing a little bit in terms of creating on his own and he was much more efficient than he was in years prior. But with him you get a guy that can shoot threes and when he's ran off the line can straight line drive and is very athletic can throw it down on you could put you on a poster. He is an okay defender as well. I think the next step for his game is seeing if he can become close to a lockdown type defender because he has the physical tools for it and I think he has the potential to become one of the better perimeter defensive forwards in the entire NBA. It remains to be seen whether or not he can get to that point, but his offensive game is good enough to justify having him 86th in my top 100. At 85, I have Larry Nance Jr. of the Portland Trailblazers. I have him above the guy he's going to back up next season in Robert Covington. There is a couple reasons for that. I really like Nance's playmaking ability. He averaged over three assists per game last season for the Cleveland Cavaliers, and that was a team whose roster was just kind of a jumbled mess. So in a more structured system with better offensive players around him, if he's given the responsibility to initiate, to pass the ball, to make plays, I could see that rising to four assists per game next season. I think he's slightly worse than Robert Covington in terms of his three-point shooting and defense, but he's still a great defender and his three-point shooting has risen the past couple of years from 35 to 36% in the last two. What has me giving him the slight edge above Robert Covington is that playmaking ability, but then also also, he's better finishing around the rim and better attacking the rim in general. He's also a better lob target. So those two areas, I think, give him a very slight edge over Rocco. And therefore, I have Larry Nance Jr. at 85. At 84, we have Seth Curry of the Philadelphia 76ers, the three-point sniper who has been maybe the best three-point shooter in the league the past couple of years. He shot 45% from behind the arc last season, averaging 12 and a half points per game, two and a half rebounds, almost three assists. I think the one thing that gets a little bit overlooked with Seth Curry is he's a better defender than you would think. I feel like most people who haven't had Seth Curry on their team just think he's an absolutely horrible defender, but Seth Curry can have some good defensive moments. He's pretty feisty on that end of the floor, and he's pretty competitive. He's undersized for sure, so he's not a versatile defender, but against ones and some smaller twos, he's just fine. But overall, he's just a guy who you have to worry about from the three-point arc. He's a guy you can run off screens. He can hit threes off the dribble. He can hit any type of three. Obviously, he's not his brother, but in terms of some of his shot making repertoire, he has a lot of the things that Steph has in his bag. So therefore, I have Seth Curry coming in at 84 in my top 100. At 83, I have another undersized shooting guard in Terry Rozier who got paid this past summer. Terry Rozier has been more of a point guard throughout his career, but I think getting LaMelo Ball next to him was a huge win for Terry Rozier because offensively he's more of a two. He's not somebody that's going to pass the ball super well. He did average 4.2 assists per game, but that was in a very up-tempo offense in Charlotte, so those numbers might be a little bit inflated. Overall, Terry Rozier is just a guy who will go out and get you a bucket. Lots of scorers in this range of the top 100. He averaged 20 points per game last season. Since coming to Charlotte, he's really been able to bump up his efficiency. Before he came to Charlotte, I was not high on Terry Rozier whatsoever. He was not efficient 
efficient enough to justify the number of shots he was taking. That has really improved his 58 true shooting percentage. It's not great, but it's good enough to justify him taking up a lot of shots on a Charlotte Hornets team that actually has a lot of scores on it. You got Gordon Hayward, you got LaMelo Ball, PJ Washington is coming into his own. Miles Bridges, we've already talked about earlier in this video, but Terry Rozier might be the most dynamic scorer out of them all. When he gets hot, he's a guy you really have to worry about. Now, I do think he got a little bit overpaid, but obviously I'm not going to knock him in a top 100 players list. Therefore, I think he belongs right here at number 83. At 82, I have Joe Ingles, the sixth man of the year runner up. I think he should have won it last season. He averaged 12 points per game, almost five assists, three and a half boards, was insanely efficient, shooting 49% from the field and 45% from three. I think that efficiency kind of takes a step back this year. I think Joe Ingles kind of overachieved shooting the ball last year. He's always been a great shooter, but uh, for his career, he's more around 40% from three, and I think his three-point percentage kind of falls back towards that. He's getting up there in age. He's going to turn 34 years old early on during next season, so I do expect him to maybe take a little bit of a step back. He's not a guy who relies on athleticism, though, so he might be a guy who doesn't have a steep fall-off in production. Athleticism is usually the number one thing that goes when you exit your prime and when you have athleticism based players exiting their prime they're going to struggle to make up for that loss in other areas joe ingles is not an athletic nba player compared to me or compared to you he's an athletic guy but compared to the athletes that are out there on the nba court he is not athletic athletic so maybe he doesn't have a drop off i don't know but i do expect him to take a slight step back in production but he's still a guy who defends really well can play make can play some three can play some four can play some shooting guard can initiate the offense he's just a super versatile player that you can fit in in numerous roles and in numerous lineup combinations so for all those reasons i still have him in my top 100 coming in at 82 and last but not least at 81 we have bogdan bogdanovich who lit the nets on fire last year for the atlanta hogs averaging 16 points per game almost four boards over three assists shooting 44 percent from three 47 from the field was super efficient and was instrumental in that eastern conference finals run that the atlanta hawks went on during the playoffs last year now i don't expect him to take a jump he's a guy who's pretty much in his prime at this point and just like joe ingles his shooting numbers might take a step back but overall i have him a spot ahead of joe ingles just because he's more dynamic of a shot making threat i feel like bogdanovich gets a little bit underrated defensively he's an okay defender has had some good moments has had some bad moments but he has some size can defend the two or the three and he's not a guy who's really going to be a defensive liability I feel like some people view him as that I don't agree with it whatsoever and keep in mind these stats were with him playing less than 30 minutes per game he was only playing 29.7 minutes per game so per 36 he's a 20 point per game scorer and one of the more underrated players in the league in my opinion therefore I have Bogdan Bogdanovich coming in at 81 and that wraps up this edition in my top 100 player series tomorrow you will get 71 through 80 and i will keep uploading these daily until we get to the number one player in the league going into next season let me know what you think about some of these guys in the comment section below i'm looking forward to reading some of your thoughts in the next video there is going to be some controversial rankings it's impossible to do a top 100 player rankings without some controversial opinions so make sure you check out tomorrow's video because there's going to be a guy in there that people really disagree with. Anyway, that wraps up this video. Thank you for watching. I hope you have a good rest of your day. And until next time, as always, peace out. Go Blazers.